All right. Welcome everybody to this morning session. And it's a real pleasure to have you all here for this session on carbon leakage, border measures, and carbon claps. My name is Simone Borghesi. I'm the director of FSR Climate, the research group on climate change at the Florence School of Regulation here at the European University Institute. And first of all, apologies for my voice. I had uh, too much of rain yesterday, so it sounds like a bit of a sexy line today, but uh, <laughs> I hope it will be a sexy session. Let's see. <laughs> This session is organized uh, in collaboration with uh, the School of Transnational Governance and the Policy Outreach Committee of uh, EAIRI, the European Association of Environmental Resource Economists. And first of all, I would like to thank STG and EAIRI for this collaboration that goes on. Uh, it has been going on for a few years, and we have yearly events together uh, at here, basically, at the State of the Union but also at the IAIRI annual conference and in the last two years at uh, the conference of the parties. So it's a great collaboration that I look forward to continue. Um, talking about COP, today we have a topic that really looks forward, is on the way to the next COP. A topic that in my view is at the very heart of the global climate policy and of the global climate negotiations. And the three topics, the three pillars of uh, this session, in my view, revolve around the border measures. Because border measures and the carbon border adjustment mechanism has a twofold goal. On the one hand, create a level playing field, and so avoid carbon leakage. On the other hand, create a forum where different jurisdictions can move together towards a global carbon pricing in the future. So create a carbon or facilitate a carbon club. And after a few years of discussions, I think we are there. We have had discussions in preparation to CBAM. We have had a negotiation process within the European uh, institutions, the trialogue, but now the CBAM seems to be a reality. In October, we will start with the regulation data collection, and in January 2026, the first payments will start. If I look back and I think of the process, I still remember uh, one particular occasion, I was giving a, a webinar uh, at Harvard during the pandemics, and I was presenting the idea of CBAM and my view. And uh, one colleague, a, a good friend actually, uh, at the end of that said, Simone, are you Europeans serious about this? <laughs> and I still remember that question because I thought, well, I, yeah, I thought I was serious. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, and I think now we can say yes. We were serious and we intend to be serious about this because we feel this is a way to proceed to move things. And actually, I see the CBAM as a, as a big game changer. But to be serious is not enough just announcing something. You're not serious when you announce that you're serious. You need to be credible. And here comes uh, the, the difficult part. Here come the secondary regulations. Here comes the implementation rules that we need to implement now. And here comes, uh, the, 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 let's say, the difficult part of the game. Although much has been done, we now need to prove that we are credible, reliable, and we need to get the others on board in this uh, interesting new, how can I say, avenue that we are going to, to walk along. And we cannot walk along that uh, street uh, alone, because obviously this is something that is to be done together with the other jurisdictions. So this leads me to the questions that I want to ask to uh, my panelists today, uh, starting with general questions like, is the CBAN fit for purpose? fit for 55, fit for climate neutrality in 2050? Is it the right way to go? 
Uh, if not, how can we uh, modify it to make sure it works uh, and it works for everybody? And what can be the expected consequences on, the, on third countries? And I'm thinking especially, for instance, on developing countries. Um, how shall we implement it? Uh, shall we go for uh, indirect emissions? Shall we go for absolute uh, carbon pricing or relative carbon pricing? So there are lots of things to discuss. But fortunately, I'm not the one discussing, so you won't have to hear to my sexy voice. But I, <laughs> I have four great panelists today to, to introduce who are really expert on the topic. So let me briefly introduce them, starting with Kurt. Kurt van Dender is acting head of the Tax Policy and Statistics Division at the Center for Tax Policy and Administration since 2013. <laughs> and he's an absolute expert on taxes, for the environment, transport, climate, and energy. He has been previously chief economist at the OECD International Transport Forum and professor of economics at the University of California at Irvine. Um, I think on your, I think it's on the Twitter account, you have under your name, tax, surprisingly. <laughs> so it's a real aspect on the topic. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Carolyn, Carolyn Fisher, you all know her. She's a research manager for sustainability and infrastructure uh, in the development research group at the World Bank. I know her very well, but I have to look at our, our affiliation because from time to time you can find it in different places. <laughs> and Carolyn uh, was uh, appointed, well, I think you still are, professor of environmental economics at the Free University in Amsterdam. Um, uh, had the Canada Research Chair in Climate Economics at the University of Ottawa. She was visiting professor at Gothenburg, research fellow for Resource for the Future, European Institute of Environmental Economics, and CESI for Research Network, and many other things. Then uh, we have Judy Meltzer. Judy is Director General of the Carbon Pricing Bureau within Environment and Climate Change Canada. And the department she works for is responsible for coordinating environmental policies and programs. And in particular, Judy works on the development of uh, regulations and on the federal government's commitment to put a carbon price in all jurisdictions in Canada. So good luck with that. And uh, then we have Susan, Susan Drege, had just moved last year uh, to uh, join the German Federal Environment Agency where she's head of division for climate protection and energy before she was senior fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And she works on the topics that will be dealt with today from carbon leakage to the international security implications of climate change and obviously emissions trading. This is needless to say in my case. And she has been advisor for German Parliament, government, but also WTO, UNEP, OECD, and others. Last but not least, at the end, dulcis in fundo, <laughs> I will call for the final remarks, uh, uh, Max uh, Massimiliano, Maxim, <laughs> Massimiliano Tavoni, who is the director of the European Institute on Economics and Environment. He's professor at the Polytechnic of Milan. He coordinated a climate change mitigation program at uh, Fondazione Mattei for four years, 15, 18. Has been fellow at Stanford and postdoc at Princeton. And uh, even in his case, he has been advisor for many important international institutions from OECD to Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. So as you see, we have the best we could uh, hope for uh, to address this difficult topic. So without much further ado, I would start with Kurt. My uh, initial invitation is for a general remark on the topic, and then we will go for a round of questions uh, from myself and from the audience. So okay. Kurt, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone. It's of course a great pleasure to be here and the weather today is fantastic so the voice will be all right soon. Um, tax, surprisingly, why surprisingly, I think if you would have asked me 20 years ago where do you see yourself uh, in 20 years, I probably would not have said at the tax directorate of the OECD um, at all actually. But it's a great, great place to be, very happy to be there. It's also increasingly, if you're in env environmental tax, carbon pricing, climate, um, it's an increasingly challenging place to be. And one of the reasons why it's challenging is the kinds of themes that are um, up there. Um, these are difficult themes, these are, these are controversial themes. Um, so what I will do in my introductory statement is talk a little bit about OECD work on carbon pricing. Um, and then try to connect that to, to some of the questions there. Uh, and after that, I will uh, briefly talk about this new OECD initiative, which is the <coughs> Inclusive Forum on Carbon Mitigation Approaches. Uh, try to tell you a little bit what this um, all is uh, going to be about. Uh, before I go there, um, I would like briefly to refer back to, to the opening session yesterday, which provided some context for the discussions that we have now emphasizing very much that the geopolitical context in which we discuss these themes has changed quite a lot uh, in, in the past couple of years. And, and this, of course, uh, will inform how the policy debate about these inter-country spillovers of climate policy is going to evolve. When I started doing environmental tax work in the tax directorate at the OECD, this was very much in a traditional environmental taxation uh, view of things. So lots of emphasis on pricing, a big focus on mitigation, um, cost effectiveness, a key principle, um, and lots of uh, attention for policy instruments. This was kind of a policy community which I can say was a bit separate from the general tax policy community and from other policy communities as well. This started changing when we evolved towards the net zero perspective. Net zero perspective, much more focus on outcomes, um, also still on instruments, but more on outcomes. Um, and the awareness that if we wanted to, to be successful in, in, in thinking about net zero and working towards net zero, that we would need to work with other policy communities. And that's when we very actively uh, started to try to bring this climate perspective in the structural economic thinking, in the broader tax policy thinking. So we started reaching out and, and that worked quite well, I think, with things like the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action and, and all these kinds of things. The perspective there was to try to bring the climate dimension into these people's uh, policy agendas. That's what we did there. Now, we're in a different phase, as I think was said at the start yesterday, we're in a different phase where climate really is in the middle of, of, of the geopolitical discussions and the geopolitical uh, agenda with themes like energy security entering their industrial policy. I mean, if you look at the speech that Jake Sullivan gave at the Brookings Institution, uh, I think last week, it's clear enough that climate is now really squarely in the middle of this, this geopolitical debate. Um, and that changes the terms of the debate. And I think we as, as climate oriented people will need to adapt uh, our narratives to make sure that we bring climate policy principles into this, uh, into this debate. So it's a little bit from that very general point of view um, that I uh, want now to talk a little bit about the OECD's work on carbon pricing. And if the, uh, I have three slides to, to illustrate this. If these could appear, that would be great. Um, but I will be talking about this OECD concept, which we call effective, um, effective carbon rates. Um, this is our indicator of, of carbon pricing. And I show this figure just to, to make clear what it is. It is the sum of now four components price signals from emissions trading systems, price signals from carbon taxes, but also price signals from fuel excise taxes. So that's maybe a little bit more unusual in the sense that it's a form of implicit carbon pricing, but we take it into account because fuel excise taxes 
are proportional to emissions just like carbon taxes are. So it's an economic view of things, if you like. We look at incentives. We think that at a high level, an indicator that combines these uh, three forms of pricing, um, that the behavioral incentives generated by these things are sufficiently similar that we think we can uh, combine them in, in one uh, summary indicator, because that's what, what the OECD contributes, is indicators and databases. The database it's, is much more disaggregated. It has these four components, also fossil fuel subsidies. Um, it has these uh, by sector, by fuel, by type of user. So it's highly disaggregated. But what I will show here is, is, is just a couple of um, high-level indicators. Um, as the slide says, emissions permits, prices, so ETSs and carbon taxes, they have a clear policy rationale in terms of pricing carbon. This is not always or not to the same extent the case for fuel excise taxes. But again, the proportionality to, to emissions is the same with fuel excise taxes. And actually, in various uh, European countries where there are carbon taxes in non-ETS sectors, they are legally defined as a component of a fuel excise tax. So uh, also in that sense, in, in a legal and economic sense, it makes sense to combine uh, these perspectives. We also include fossil fuel subsidies. Um, not all fossil fuel subsidies. We include fossil fuel subsidies that take the form of tax incentives. And those fossil fuel subsidies, of which it makes sense to map them into a price metric. Not all fossil fuel subsidies, for example, some production subsidies, are easily translated into this price dimension. So we don't take these into account. But a large range of fossil fuel subsidies is measured. So that's a database um, and an indicator which we've been um, preparing for a couple of years now. Um, what does it cover? Well, uh, 71 countries, 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, OECD, G20, and an increasingly large number of developing and emerging economies are covered um, in, in this database. So it's in that sense also quite uh, comprehensive and we uh, keep um, extending it. Um, I think my colleague, I mean IMF World Bank, views of what to take into account when you look at the carbon price signal from an economic point of view converge quite significantly, I think, but we, we can discuss that if that uh, should be of interest. So um, that's the indicator. Um, very quickly, 2018 and 2021, to compare those, um, what we see is rising coverage of emissions by, um, by effective carbon rates, so by some form of carbon pricing. Um, also, in some parts of the world, increasing prices, but not in all parts of the world, increasing prices, and therefore rising differences in, um, in carbon prices uh, across the world. Um, where does the dynamic come from if you compare 2018, uh, 2021 to 2018? The dynamic comes almost entirely from emissions trading systems, right? So that's where the action is uh, in carbon pricing. Hardly any increase of emissions by a carbon tax or by a fossil fuel, um, fossil fuel excise tax, but um, 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 emissions trading systems coverage increases there. And I see that the crucial line in the table actually has disappeared, but a big increase in coverage by emissions trading systems. So that's one of, uh, um, observation. The other is that the average rates um, um, increase, and this is also mainly because higher prices in emissions trading systems. Okay. Um, this is 2021. We are currently working on an update. Updating this database is actually uh, e extremely uh, labor intensive, which is why it's a bit slow. We need to get all the data from countries. We need to um, assign these to the tax base, the emissions base that we get from the International Energy Agency. It's a lot of work. We're doing, the, doing that work. What we will see if we look at 2023 um, is that these increases in emissions trading systems prices um, continue. Uh, higher prices in, in the EU compared to 2021 
um, and not just in the EU, also um, Canadian systems, uh, significantly higher prices. So the price increase in emissions trading systems and to some extent carbon taxes in Canada is, is, um, is taking place which sort of amplifies this trend of rising differences in, uh, in effective carbon prices uh, across uh, the globe. What we also will see, of course, if we compare 2023 to 2021, and it's actually already in last year's report, is all these fuel excise cuts which have taken place uh, in response to the energy price hikes, mainly in Europe. Um, fuel excise is in our indicator, so we will, we will see that in our indicator. And these cuts are significant, right? Often more than 50 euros per ton uh, equivalent reduction of, of fuel excise taxes. So this is, this is quite uh, significant. Differences between countries increase 2021 to 2018, and this continues um, to the present day. Uh, I'm actually going to go back before I go to this um, IFCMA thing. Um, so, how does it connect to, to the themes uh, of this session? Well, of course, if you see rising differences in prices, that um, makes it clear why considerations about border measures become increasingly more, uh, more pressing. I mean, that's not very difficult to see. Uh, and, and it's clear in the data that this, this tension between those parts of the world that price and those that don't, that this is, this is rising. Um, and as specifically then the, the EU ETS is you know, evolving from a system that prices emissions at the margin to one that drives economic transformation. Um, and if you're going to drive economic transformation, the prospect of working with free permits as a way to combat leakage becomes increasingly more problematic. You need to start doing something else. You need to start uh, working with different ways to, to address leakage. And that's, I think, the, the rationale behind the border carbon measures in general and the CBAM uh, specifically. So in that sense, uh, what is happening there is a, a kind of a natural reaction in view of transformational climate policy to, to trends that, that we um, observe. Um, there is a big question there, you mentioned it. Um, if you're going to be um, uh, evolving in, in this direction, uh, border carbon measures, um, one question is what do you account for in other policies when you're going to be deciding on the CBAM um, liability, the CBAM tariff? Um, is the idea to only look at um, ETSs and carbon taxes, which I think um, in, in, in the discussions in the European Commission uh, was my impression this, this was the idea. The CBAM is very closely linked to the ETS, so we will take into account similar policies in other parts of the world um, to the extent that in the EU free permits are being phased out. So that's, that's the logic there. Um, you could argue on the basis of this effective carbon rates indicator, why don't you look at fuel tax as well? That's largely a theoretical debate because in the CBAM sectors, it's not about fuel taxes. The story really is ETSs and carbon taxes. So this is kind of a, a mute question that I don't think is, is I mean, it's may, maybe of theoretical interest, but not, not of immediate uh, policy interest. Um, there was a discussion yesterday, uh, and it's also in, in the paper that, uh, that was uh, shared in advance of this, uh, this meeting. Um, the idea is, should voluntary markets be considered in, in, uh, when uh, prices in voluntary markets be considered when thinking about um, uh, CBAM um, um, levels of, of pricing? Um, that was discussed to some extent in the session yesterday. There are sig significant challenges to overcome with voluntary mechanisms. So that maybe is there some way to go perhaps before that, that, that could be considered very, very concretely. That's my take of the discussion yesterday. People, people can correct me and, and, and see if my, my take um, is not the correct one. So that's one other discussion. A further discussion is, and it's also mentioned in, in this background paper, should we look at non-pricing policies? Um, should CBAM uh, compensate for non-pricing policies? Um, there, the response is relatively straightforward. If you take CBAM as it is, um, the effect of non-pricing policies is taken into account not through the rate, but via the base. 
So if you have non-pricing policies that are going to uh, reduce the carbon content of your exports to the EU, that reduced, carb reduced carbon content will, uh, will immediately reduce your um, CBAM liability. So this is taken into account. Um, when I say this, um, I hear remarks to the order of yes, yes but that implies a view uh, that we should limit the discussion to CBAM sectors and not look at mitigation action at the level of a country. So that's a different perspective that, that sometimes um, is offered. And that's maybe a, a discussion to be had. Um, one other trend that I notice, or well, yeah, maybe a trend um, that I notice in this context is that people talk about, in the context of CBAM, border carbon measures, this is about instruments, about policies, right? That's the focus. You could alternatively think in terms of outcomes. So what is the carbon content of exports and how does this carbon content enter into um, access to markets, trade agreements? Um, that's a discussion which is uh, emerging as well. Uh, and, and I hear sometimes the view that this is an alternative approach or a complementary approach. Uh, if you can tell me which it is, I would be very happy. So thank you uh, for that. Um, so. Clearly, these, conditions, these things are going to be taking place in this very general context uh, of geopolitical um, uh, um, discussions, conditions, which have changed. Finally, because I think I'm talking way too long, um, this inclusive forum on carbon mitigation <coughs> approaches, a new OECD uh, initiative. Um, we had our first big meeting of this initiative in early February. Lots of people there, so that's great. Lots of people from um, lots of countries and from uh, very high level positions. Uh, also fellow um, um, international organizations were present there. Um, what is this about? Well, I mean, there's a line there which I took from the flyer on the IFCMA. Um, the IFCMA can contribute to inclusive multilateral dialogue to help ensure that emission reduction efforts of individual countries and jurisdictions help reduce global emissions and not just, just shift emissions around. So that connects to some of the themes that uh, we are discussing here, potentially. Why do I say potentially? Because it is the inclusive frame, sorry, inclusive forum on carbon mitigation approaches. Inclusive means it goes beyond OECD. Right? It is not just OECD countries. There's a very uh, broad range of countries which is uh, invited to participate in this initiative. And we are now at the stage where we're talking to these countries to, to get them to, to join. A fair number have joined. We are now at around 65 countries, roughly. Um, some very large emerging uh, economies, developing economies have joined, some very large emerging economies also have not joined. So that discussion is, is ongoing. Um, the idea is that it's inclusive. So we don't want to be constraining what the discussion is going to be about at this point. That is really for the inclusive forum to decide um, as we go along. It's a forum, it's not a framework. <coughs> Those of you familiar with the tax work, the inclusive framework on BEPS, this had a very specific negotiation um, and outcome uh, perspective. This is not the case for, uh, for this inclusive forum. The idea is to do technical analytical work and to provide a forum for dialogue. No um, view on specific policy outcomes or negotiation outcomes that we, that we uh, envisage. The focus on, is on mitigation, not on adaptation and on finance. In the dialogue, it's conceivable that people may want to combine these dimensions, but certainly in, in the technical work, the focus is on, um, uh, on mitigation. Uh, approaches, approaches is we want to look at mitigation policies very broadly, not pricing alone, definitely not pricing alone, all kinds of policy approaches uh, related to uh, mitigation without any prejudice of what is the better policy for any specific country. We really, really just want to take that uh, very broad perspective and um, assess the impact on emissions. So that's the technical work, a stock take, mapping, assessing impact on emissions. That's very easy to say. 
Uh, I don't have to elaborate for this crowd that it's exceedingly difficult to do. So this is a very, diff very uh, ambitious project, which we are starting um, at this point, and I hope you will hear much more about. First technical meeting in the middle of June. And that's where I would stop, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, very interesting work, what you've been doing, and this idea of creating a synthetic indicator, I think it's extremely useful as much as this forum in creating and going to the, the technicalities that we need to, to sort out. Uh, you gave us a, an international perspective to start with, and I would now move to, to Carolyn asking to go more in depth into this aspect, for instance, which sectors or which countries uh, are, in your view, more exposed to, to CBAM. Um, and we will build up <laughs> upon that. Thanks, Simone. I'm very happy to be here. This has uh, been a topic of interest for me for uh, at least 15 <laughs> years, 20 years before, it was a, a gleam in the eye of the European Union for CBAM. Uh, I don't know, Susanna, when did we start working together on this? Uh, yes, I, it, it, I mean, it's, so it's, it's been a very interesting and challenging topic. How do you design climate policy, especially carbon pricing policy, uh, for, you know, unilaterally for a domestic country to address a global pollutant in a way that maintains the integrity of the um, domestic uh, reductions, um, avoiding carbon leakage, while staying within the constraints of um, WTO obligations and, um, and also respecting other international principles like common but differentiated responsibilities. Um, so, uh, th you know, so it's very exciting now to see a lot of this we're coming to fruition in terms of the EU CBAM. Um, I'm you know, relatively uh, new to the World Bank. I've been there a year and a half, so my perspective on this um, uh, maybe predates some of this, but I do wanna highlight some, uh, some work that we have been doing um, at the World Bank at all uh, at, um, um, uh, together. Uh, so first uh, on uh, this title slide, let me uh, remember the disclaimer uh, that's very important. Uh, <laughs> these, uh, uh, the findings here, these, these are my opinions and mine alone. They do not represent those of the um, World Bank, its affiliated organizations, or the executive directors of the World Bank or the governments they represent. Uh, um, just because I, I can get highly opinionated and I don't want to impose those opinions on anyone. Else. So I'm calling this carbon pricing and CBAM metrics some of the limits of border, um, border adjustments. I want to maybe temper some of our uh, expectations here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, the first point that I, I'd like to make is that, you know, I think it's important not to conflate uh, border adjustments like the CBAM uh, with climate clubs. These are, are actually kind of different, um, uh, different approaches. So a, a climate club for me is, uh, you know, uh, a, a joint effort uh, to use sticks and carrots to basically get countries to join together for uh, common uh, goals and, and increase ambition. Um, and so there have been proposals uh, to form a climate club and use uh, trade measures as uh, an enforcement mechanism. Now, this isn't really what the CBAM is designed to do. Border carbon adjustments are designed to implement basically destination-based carbon pricing for consumers to ensure that uh, consumers uh, in the EU face the, the full prices, fully loaded prices, including the, um, the, you know, the cost of the emissions embodied, embodied in these goods. This is important for leveling the playing field within the EU for uh, clean alternative products. 
Um, so having price pass through of the embodied carbon costs and products is important to, uh, for making uh, clean goods competitive on the market and seeking um, other alternatives and using less, uh, um, consuming less carbon intensive goods as well as making those goods we have less carbon intensive. In the absence of this, you need to resort to massive subsidies, which we're talking about in the other session parallel to this one. Um, so uh, the other point I wanted to make is that, you know, the, the uh, you know, the leverage that you get with a CBAM. So you do get some, some incentives uh, for, uh, you know, for uh, producers that are exporting their goods into the EU, they're facing a carbon price incentive now. So there is some, uh, uh, some incentive for them to uh, reduce their emissions. Um, but there, to be honest, there isn't a whole lot of incentive for the governments of their countries to actually, um, you know, implement certainly broad-based uh, carbon pricing. It's a, it's a fairly weak lever, and um, I'll sh show you uh, next why that is. Um, but, you know, that said, um, I think it can be helpful in pursuing sector-based um, sector approaches. Uh, you know, the CBAM is limited to a certain number of particularly energy intensive and trade exposed sectors. And, um, you know, for certain exporting countries, uh, that may actually, uh, you know, uh, be the, the cost involved may actually be significant. And this may be a road towards incentivizing uh, more ambition as a way to, um, uh, to address it. And then the, uh, the last point I want to make on, on this aspect is that, you know, uh, for developing economies, the other limitation is that sticks, sticks alone aren't going aren't gonna to do it. You know, so you may have some, create some incentives from sticks, but if you don't have the, the finance to actually address it and, um, and you know, decarbonize these in industries, you're not going to um, get much outcome from it. So there really, you know, need, need to be carrots combined, uh, combined with these sticks. Um, so with some colleagues uh, uh, from the um, uh, trade global practice, we've been uh, interested in trying to identify, well, which, you know, which developing countries are going to be highly exposed to the CBAM. So we've uh, uh, developed this the CBAM exposure index. It's basically, um, you know, we're, we're taking a notional carbon price of $100. It's now about 100 euros. That's, you know, I don't know what the exchange rates are these days, but it's, you know, it's, it's, the, ball it's the right ballpark. Um, times the, the carbon intensity per, per dollar of the CBAM sectors. And then, uh, and then it's weighted by the ratio of, um, so it's the, um, uh, the value of exports in these sectors to the EU um, as a share of the total exports from these covered uh, sectors to, to the world. So, so it's a combination of how emission intensive are you and how much, of, uh, how much are you trade dependent on the EU in these sectors. Um, and so we have a uh, total CBAM exposure index. That's what that is. And, that's, and those are the, um, the blue bars. Um, and, and then we also have a relative CBAM exposure index. Because I think it's important to recognize that um, this isn't happening in a vacuum. The EU is uh, also imposing carbon pricing on its own firms and withdrawing the free allocation. So the relative CBAM exposure index looks at, okay, how much more emission intensive are you than the EU average? And, you know, and then weighted by your trade exposure to the EU. And that's kind of a different question. So that's, that's actually then recognizing that if you're, you know, so you may have significant costs, you know, uh, potentially. So you may have to be buying a lot of CBAM allowances if you continue the same number of, amount of exports to the EU. But 
if, uh, you're, if the competitors in the EU are having to do the same thing, then actually your relative competitiveness hasn't changed that much either. So that's why the orange bar is lower than the blue bar. And you see this you know, can make a, a, make a big difference. So like Cameroon, if you look at, you know, they're potentially quite exposed in terms of the, the CBAM permits that they would have to buy. Um, but, you know, they're in, in the sectors or the sectors where they're, you know, exporting to the EU, they're actually, you know, their emissions intensity isn't really that different. So, um, so the relative, their relative CBAM exposure is very little. Um, and so this way we're sort of identifying, um, you know, the, the countries that are likely to be highly exposed. So we have Zimbabwe, Ukraine, uh, uh, Belarus, uh, well, um, there are other issues with these, uh, more pressing issues with some of these countries now, uh, India, um, uh, for example. Um, and so this also helps us identify, you know, so which countries do we need to, uh, you know, so, so these are the countries where there's, there's some sticks, actually, in, in, at least in these industries. Um, you know, these industries are, for the most part, a small share of the overall economy. So, uh, so that's why I, I'm... I'm less optimistic of being able to hang a lot of, you know, uh, you know, nationwide carbon pricing <laughs> initiatives and being induced by the CBAM. But for some of these industries, you know, I think there are opportunities to um, uh, to consider what what measures uh, can be introduced to reduce their exposure to the CBAM, and where you know I think the European Union should should really think about its responsibility also to to um, uh, and other donor countries to offer some carrots to help uh, finance decarbonization um, in these sectors and countries. Okay, uh, then, you know, a, a second set of comments, uh, I asked Kurt to go first uh, uh, because it, it also relates to this question of effective carbon rates or, or we're calling it total carbon pricing. Um, and, you know, uh, and I agree, you know, when you think of what is the EU CBAM designed to do, it's adjusting for the EU ETS, the ETS price for the ETS covered sectors and actually a subset of those ETS covered sectors. So, you know, so you, there, uh, you know, for, you, one can ask, you know, imported goods to, uh, you know, to pay for like comparable, you know, uh, comparable costs that they would have had to had they been produced in the EU with, with the ETS. So, uh, but not, uh, you know, so, so this is why you can't, you know, uh, impose a CBAM on sectors not covered by the ETS and why it's difficult to um, adjust, uh, give credits for policies that are, um, you know, not carbon pricing policies like the ES, ETS. Um, and so as has been mentioned, you know, there, there are two ways to lower your CBAM liability. Um, one, uh, and the first one is to reduce your emissions intensity. And, you know, if, if you have effect, if another country has effective climate policies, non-market policies or non-pricing policies that reduce, uh, that are effective, then that's going to reduce the emissions intensity and reduce the CBAM liability. The other way is to give credits for uh, comparable, I think they use the term effective um, carbon pricing in the country of, of origin. Um, and so, so there, uh, one would have to demonstrate that um, the, the payments that have been made, so these would be net of free allocation as they, as they are in the EU. And that, you know, that does get complicated. And I, I think like Kurt, for, you know, I, I don't know of other regimes that, um, that use carbon pricing that for industrial sectors that, um, 
don't have a, a lot of special treatment options. So I, I, don't, I don't know that there's a lot of uh, payments for um, embodied carbon net of free allocation to worry about. But hopefully in the future, in the near future, there will be. And so, so one can think of a way to um, calculate and, and, and document that. But um, I, I, I don't think that one should be going around trying to estimate what non-pricing um, policies are, are there. Um, the uh, other point, I guess, where, where, which is a limitation, um, uh, is, is that you know, if you're, you're only uh, adjusting for explicit or what we're calling direct uh, carbon pricing via carbon tax or, or ETS. Um, it, well, direct carbon pricing is actually a pretty small share of total carbon pricing, or what the OECD is calling effective carbon rates. And so we've had uh, another effort to try to, um, you know, to broaden this this metric. So um, we so uh, so we've been calculating total carbon pricing for. So we've got basically twice the number of countries as in the OECD. OECD database, but unfortunately to do so, we have to rely on more indirect data. So for, um, I mean, we have the direct carbon pricing data, that's fine, but for indirect um, carbon pricing, we have a, a database of um, of uh, fuel prices, so we've got you know uh, retail uh, uh, fuel prices and then um, supply costs, and we're looking at the sort of the gap between the retail prices and and and, and supply costs to as a, as a proxy for what the uh, net indirect uh, um, carbon tax uh, via fuels are so net um, net um, fuel taxes net of subsidies so it's it's a little it's a little imperfect um, uh, because it's not you know statutory review um, but it's a, it's you know gives you a pretty decent sense of what's going on and what's going on over over time because then we have a full a full uh, range so this is going back what to like 1990 um, so you've got more comprehensive data but again caveats on um, on uh, some of the quality, um, and so see, here we see that there, you know, there is a, a slight, modest upward trend in total carbon pricing, uh, but you see really that the direct carbon prices, so carbon taxes and ETS prices, you know, they're they have historically been relatively low and don't cover a whole lot, and so they're they're relatively small. Um, uh, but we also see, you know, distinct uh, patterns. Um, so, you know, fuel exporting countries have uh, low. So, th so on the far left, we have um, ex fuel exporting uh, 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 low. Um, low and low middle income countries. Uh, you know, there are a lot of fuel subsidies that we still have, fossil fuel subsidies that we still have to address. Um, uh, fuel importing low and low middle income uh, countries, uh, yeah, you know, basically just don't have a lot of uh, taxation. And then as we get into the upper middle income and high income countries, we see increasing levels, particularly of indirect um, taxation, and again, more uh, on the part of fuel importers than, than exporters. So part of this message is that, um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, not just on carbon pricing, but also on fossil fuel subsidies and fossil fuel pricing. And, you know, but we also need to think about, um, you know, so what, what qualifies as, as a carbon price? Um, you know, because there are uh, countries now that are renaming their fossil fuel excise taxes as carbon taxes, and so now they're entering the state and trends of carbon pricing. And but there's so so this makes the point that we need to we need to keep track of the full uh, suite <laughs> of um, uh, fossil fuel pricing and look at you know to to really see how well are we aligning. Uh, the prices with their um, carbon costs. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is the last, last figure. Um, so breaking this down by fuels on the left and sectors on the right. And so we see a lot of these pre-existing kind of, you know, in, indirect 
uh, taxes are you know, primarily on transfer, transportation fuels, so uh, diesel and gasoline. And so we see then the transportation sector is the, you know, has the highest you know, total carbon price applied to it. Um, and we look down at, so the power sector is in red and the uh, industry is that purple line. So these are uh, among the least taxed uh, sectors, um, and you know, so these are the ones that we're we're really thinking about with the uh, ETS uh, and, and the CBAM. And so you do see, so, you know, some of the effects. Uh, so on, on so on coal, the uptick in carbon pricing there is largely a result of ETSs uh, and 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 um, to some extent carbon taxes. Um, and in the industrial sector, so we do see, so we see, a, a, you know, kind of a jump down uh, in recent times, you know, due to uh, the cuts in the uh, in the fuel excise taxes there, and that also has implications for for industry. Um, so, so, so thinking. So, this also sort of reinforces one of Kurt's statements that you know m maybe at, at this point we don't have to worry about a lot of the indirect taxes for um, uh, for the uh, the covered sectors because um, uh, you know and still uh, the, this would include some of the transportation fuel taxes which aren't um, again aren't uh, adjusted for in the CBAM. So uh, just to conclude, uh, you know, I th we still have a long way to go in terms of carbon pricing and climate action more broadly. Uh, but you know, the, uh, the EU ETS, the CBAM, and the phase out of free allocation is really an important step. I think you know, Europe is leading the way towards really putting the polluter pays principle into practice. We want, uh, you know, we want to get these prices right. Um, you know, I think there there is some leverage uh, from the CBAM. I actually think a lot of it is really in terms of leadership and demonstrating that um, carbon pricing is an effective means to uh, reducing emissions. Um, it's raising awareness um, uh, around the world of the effectiveness of these systems. Um, and also it's you know, creating demand for low carbon products. Um, so I, I think it, you know, it, in many ways, it's having an outsized effect, certainly even before it's being implemented. There's a lot of attention on it. Um, but just a reminder that you know, in pure economic incentive terms, they're, they're pretty limited except for you know, certain sectors and countries. But again, you know, this is just one tool in the toolbox for, for climate action. Um, but uh, you know, I'm... I'm uh, glad to see it going forward and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Karen. Actually, uh, it's true, it's a long way to go, but we needed to start <laughs> somewhere. But you, it was very interesting to see where the problems might emerge uh, in your analysis. Um, we know it's going to be a bumpy road, but we can also tell where the bumps are or where we can expect them. In some cases, I have to say I was a bit worried in seeing your results when I see countries like Ukraine, Russia, or uh, Egypt, India. Well, but maybe we can come back on this, but it's good to know where the problems uh, are going to occur. Uh, I will now move to my left. <laughs> to Judy in particular, and somehow continuing what we have been uh, talking about so far, I would like to ask you, from your perspective, uh, the experience to date in determining the equivalence between the different types of pricing that we have been talking about. So uh, what have been the lessons learned for, from your perspective, for Quebec, from the Canadian uh, perspective in general? <laughs> 
Thanks very much, uh, Simone, and it's uh, it's really nice to be here, and um, and really appreciate this very timely discussion. So I will I'll focus my uh, comments on um, our experience to date in uh, assessing uh, comparability and equivalence across different types of pricing systems in the Canadian context, and also um, looking at how we're addressing uh, risks of carbon leakage in in Canada as well. So just for context, by way of background, um, carbon pricing. So explicit carbon pricing is a centerpiece of the Government of Canada's uh, climate change plan, but there are also a range of measures, including other uh, regulations, uh, programs, incentives. I'm going to try hard not to be distracted by the fly that's buzzing around me right now. (laughs) It's never a good sign. Um, but uh, uh, so we have a mix um, of carrots and sticks in, in, the, in our climate plan, but it's certainly the case that carbon pricing is a center p- pillar. And the federal approach in Canada to carbon pricing um, is uh, it gives uh, flexibility to our subnational governments, so our provinces and territories, to implement the type of carbon pricing system um, of their choosing. Um, And the federal carbon pricing system serves as a backstop. So the federal carbon pricing system is implemented in provinces and territories that request it, that would prefer the federal government to implement it, or uh, that don't or choose not to implement a system um, that aligns with some common minimum national stringency requirements. So while we provide the flexibility for a type of system, um, uh, we uh, want to try and ensure comparable stringency by setting these common minimum national stringency requirements that we refer to as the federal benchmark. So the federal carbon pricing system um, consists of a charge in fossil fuels um, and a regulated performance-based trading system uh, for um, emissions-intensive and trade-exposed industries and output-based pricing system. So the rationale for this um, slightly more complex approach in the Canadian context was to take into account that we, um, some provinces in Canada, notably uh, Quebec and also British Columbia, had well-established carbon pricing systems in place for some time, um, but different types of systems, so a cap-and-trade system in Quebec and uh, a carbon tax in British Columbia. So the federal approach in Canada was explicitly designed to try to recognize uh, different types of carbon pricing systems, but also try to find ways to have comparable stringency and equivalency uh, across the country uh, to ensure that systems were comparable and effective. Um, the, I won't go into detail about um, kind of getting into the weeds of the common minimum stringency requirements for all systems, but some of the common criteria include things, of course, like common uh, uh, scope of emissions coverage, Um, We have a minimum price for direct pricing systems. It's currently $65 a ton Canadian, and it's going up by $15 a year to 170 in 2030. Uh, For cap and trade systems, um, the criteria ensure that caps are set at levels that drive similar reductions as to what would be expected from that same minimum uh, price. Um, We have requirements to ensure that robust uh, marginal price signals as maintained across all covered emissions in our output-based pricing systems. Um, We also have some criteria with respect to revenue return to ensure that it's not used in ways that directly negate the price signal. So so this is the the Canadian approach to carbon pricing um, to date. In terms of lessons, so um, we, are, we sort of think about our approach at the federal level in terms of two phases. So we've implemented this approach. There's been pricing in place across the country in Canada since 2019. And we did a stock take of how things were going and, and whether our, um, uh, our common minimum national standards, our federal benchmark was fit for purpose in 2022. And we made some updates and adjustments to strengthen those criteria for the 2023 to 2030 period. So those are now in effect. So we continue to learn as we go. Um, The other thing that I'll just note is we also made some adjustments to our approach to try and provide a bit more price certainty to our pricing systems, which is something that we've heard increasingly um, is of interest in particular to um, regulated industries. Um, So we, um, of course, one of the things was to forecast a price trajectory or commit to a price trajectory out to 2030. Um, That's included um, in a schedule in our legislation. 
uh, for direct pricing systems, um, but also we adapted our process. So we shifted from an annual to a multi-year assessment of alignment with our federal um, minimum national stringency requirements. So we assess systems out to 2030. Uh, and we're going to be doing uh, an interim review um, to stock taken in, in 2026. In terms of mitigating uh, carbon leakage risks, so um, to date in Canada, this is currently done within the design of our domestic carbon pricing systems, including through some free allocation to emissions intensive trade exposed industries. Um, so this varies a little bit across system type, um, but for our cap and trade systems like elsewhere, some allowances are distributed for free. In our output-based pricing systems, we impose a compliance obligation on a portion of a sector's emissions. And free allocation under the federal output-based system um, is really adjusted based on um, an assessment of leakage risks at the sectoral level. Um, so it, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that we need to continue to assess this to ensure that these measures are sufficient to address carbon leakage risks, in particular as we see increasing stringency and a rising carbon price over time. So this is something that we'll need to pay close attention to. So Canada doesn't currently have plans to implement um, a border carbon adjustment measure, but it's certainly something that we continue to consider and explore. So we did publish a background paper on this in 2021, um, really to outline what these measures are and how they work. Um, we've engaged with industry and stakeholders on border carbon adjustment measures, and uh, we certainly continue to engage with our international uh, partners on this. Um, in the Canadian context, of course, a key consideration for us when we think about border carbon adjustment measures is um, the fact that um, the U.S. is our largest trading partner and taking into account the fact that it doesn't have a carbon pricing system in place at the national level. So currently our focus internationally with respect to carbon pricing is on um, our, our Prime Minister's Global Carbon Pricing Challenge. This was something that Dirk referenced in his comments yesterday. Um, our Ambassador for Climate Change, Catherine Stewart is here and she's gonna speak to this in more detail this afternoon. So I won't go into details about it now. But essentially, it aims to um, accelerate the expansion of explicit pricing systems globally. And I think it's, um, you know, to make the obvious link, um, this is helpful in, you know, that combined with uh, more consistent stringency across pricing systems is helpful in mitigating carbon leakage risks. Um, and in that respect, we see it as complementary to um, border carbon adjustment measures insofar as these initiatives are aiming to try and increase ambition and implementation of carbon pricing. Um, so I think it's interesting to see kind of the interplay of how these can kind of work together to push in the same direction, a bit of a mix of carrots and sticks at the, the global level. I think I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, and, and maybe returning to kind of one of the broader questions of this panel, I think there is certainly renewed interest um, and attention to carbon pricing, but carbon leakage risks more generally. Um, I think things like the German, German-led uh, Climate Club and certainly the broader context of CBAM will, I think, hopefully create the opportunity and impetus for us to continue to assess and understand what these risks are. Um, I think we'd certainly be benefiting from uh, getting a more granular understanding of carbon leakage risks as they pertain to specific um, sectors and specific industries. And also the interplay between that and um, some of the decisions around investments in uh, the higher cost um, projects um, that we know we need for uh, in decarbonizing our heavy industry um, in order to be able to meet our net zero 2050 goals. So I think it's a really timely discussion and looking forward to, uh, to hearing more. So I'll uh, end my comments there. Thanks, Simone. Thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> Before I move on, just one question, a clarification question. We were, you were talking about free allocation. I was wondering whether uh, you have a timeline for the free allocation, let's say a phasing out of free allocation in the future that, that, that you have in mind, or whether this has not been discussed yet. 
Yeah, so again, just in the context of having different types of systems and giving jurisdictions the flexibility to des design their systems um, in a way that makes sense for their circumstances. I won't speak to all systems. I know uh, Jean-Yves Benoit is here and will be able to speak to the Quebec system, for example. But at the federal level, yes. So one of the things that we um, strengthened in our, um, uh, what we call the federal benchmark, these common minimum national stringency requirements for all systems, is we... Um, uh, required that a marginal price signal um, for output-based pricing systems, which is what we implement federally for EIT industries, um, that there be a, a robust marginal price signal across all covered emissions at the benchmark price of that year. And that invariably requires um, a tightening and a reduction of free allocation over time. So we're all act we're currently adjusting our regulations to deliver that. So what we've proposed is to tighten um, our output-based standards, so basically reduce the free allocation by 2% year over year. And we expect to be publishing final regulations uh, this fall, and uh, final regulations will apply retroactively to the beginning of this year so that we can cover this 2023 to 2030 period. So we do expect, and we expect to see the same things in other systems um, in order to meet these strengthened requirements to maintain that robust price signal. And uh, we also see um, uh, some strengthening in our cap and trade systems. But again, I'll defer to my uh, colleague from Quebec to speak uh, to his system more specifically. Okay, great. So thank you, Judy. Uh, we move from one side of the war to the other, come closer to, to the European perspective, to the German perspective in this case. And I would like to invite Susan to give her own perspective, actually, uh, based on her experience, um, as I was saying, on also in the international dimension of these instruments. And I'd like to, you to express your opinion on, on CBAM as an obstacle or as an opportunity for a global carbon pricing, which in the end seems to be the, uh, uh, the target we are all aiming at. Uh, will it help? Will it <laughs> obstacle the process? And in both cases, how? Yeah, thanks, Simone, and thanks for having me again here in this context and this forum. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Environment Agency, the federal one in Germany, yet um, some things relate very much to the work the agency does, so I would like to inform you about this work as well. And before I turn to your question, um, I would really like, I took so many notes already, um, so colleagues let, um, laid the ground for a substantial debate here. I would like to, to talk about the CBEM as I see it over the time. And I think, although, in the context of international talks, there's a lot of international uh, purpose attached to the CBAM. It is really a, a project by the EU focusing on the internal logic of the ETS first and foremost. So the idea of um, phasing out free allocation and finding a substitute, the CBAM or border carbon adjustments were early in the debate and they were totally dismissed. And we had a turnaround. I think it was a hot potato still in 2020. And then it became the poster child of the commission. And that's an interesting twist because it relates exactly to what we heard from Jos yesterday. It has turned into a tool that can be used in many ways. It has a function as a carrot and as a stick. And the geopolitical situation topped by the U war against the Ukraine has has made it a given instead of a questionable approach towards anti-leakage measures uh, to be taken. So it has an enormous career, <laughs> has seen an enormous career, and now we need to make sense out of it uh, because it's overburdened. Yeah? Uh, as Karen said, there are many other tools to address uh, climate um, protection. Um, the... Um, the, the, the question whether or not it will deliver and uh, also what the context is, is, is still to be seen. And uh, the very positive aspect is that it, it has a lot of time to, to, develop, to develop. As you said, Simona, it will be uh, three years until there will be any financial flows attached to it. Um, and then um, how it can be sold is a different level of argumentation than the question whether it will work. Um, I think the narrative of the EU is still in the making um, because we, we have experienced that 
um, carbon pricing, the interest in carbon pricing has increased in those countries that were, you know, kind of flirting with the concept or were having some kind of carbon price in place like the Ukraine had. I mean, I'm talking about the time before the war or Turkey, who was supported already by the ERCST, um, the, sorry, <laughs> the, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development of, on, on a carbon tax yeah, or an ETS instead. So there is an appetite for carbon pricing in, in other countries that has become yeah, new speed or no, new interest, but that's not meaning and at all that it's going to happen. That's the answer to your question as a quick turnaround. And the second topic that Caroline already addressed is the question where to go with this idea of a climate club. Uh, the Germans initiated um, already in 2021. Um, it, is, it started with a concept by Nordhaus to have something around carbon pricing and secure the, the idea um, of a club that yeah, um, could become attractive for others also with respect to carbon pricing. This was actually dropped from the manuscript. It was not, this, this is not what you can read now in the statement by the G7. It was pushed forward to the G7 level. And of course the OECD uh, was the institution that's gonna drive this forward. What we have now is the idea that the German foreign policy on climate action is, this is a roof, the idea to work with democracies, with liberal democracies on this topic. And the pillars are, keeping up the spirit of the Paris Agreement, a vision, all right, everybody agrees. Um, the second pillar is um, decarbonization of industry or end slash the third one is bilateral talks on energy policy, coal phase out. That's basically what it boils down to. And it's evolving over time as a format that you could put things into it on the go. So I think at the Petersburg Climate Dialogue held yesterday and today in Berlin, we will see another push for the club uh, idea and the word inclusive was used from the very beginning. Now find the, find the error in the system. You cannot have an ex exclusive club which is inclusive. So we, we struggled a lot with it uh, in, in Germany, and especially now that the new government wants to have a broad approach and mainstream climate action across all uh, ministries in order to reach out to other countries. So we will see how this will evolve. We didn't see anything around the club idea in Sapporo this year in Japan, but again, we saw talks about industry decarbonization. And I think this is the core it boils down to. And this is the issue that will also connect to the CBAM discussion we have on carbon intensities, who's first mover in bringing down emissions and what kind of measure a country is taking. The discussion will be about standard setting, about incentives, and uh, the leakage discussion will definitely um, play a role here. And it all reminds me um, of sector agreements we have discussed so much in the uh, years, I think 15 years ago, as one way to push the international climate action forward because you have only a handful of countries that actually have um, these heavy industries in place. And so uh, let's see how it evolves. Um, last point, turning back to the situation um, in 2023, we see that the big emitters are not really keen or not really pushing this club idea in a, in a manner we would like to see it evolve. Um, Brazil was the last one who said no to the offer to become a club member. So um, we will probably um, see a twist when there are elections in the US. And um, the Chinese are rather nervous about the border carbon adjustment or carbon border adjustment mechanism in that case than about any club that could circumvent there or leave them out as outsiders. So um, that was my uh, additional comments and I look forward to the discussion because I think there are many things still not uh, being addressed and um, we can sort this out. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Yes, indeed. I want to open a uh, discussion to the floor. Just one comment on, on, on the inclusive aspect of Carbon Clubs. We should probably change name, in my view. Because, you know, I'm used to textbooks in which 
clubs are exclusive by the definition. So uh, I know this just about wording, but I, I'd rather call it something like coalition or, <laughs> rather than clubs, because it, the, the, the idea of exclusiveness uh, emerges all the time when we talk about carbon clubs, and we don't want that to happen, in my view. Okay, so um, I open now the uh, floor to questions from the audience. I have a long list of questions, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So uh, if you have burning questions already, please raise your hand. We have the first volunteer. Yeah, there is a microphone to thank you. <clears throat> a really fascinating contribution. Guy Turner from Trove Research. Um, if I can sort of simplify the CBAM in my mind, it's got two purposes. It's a political instrument to ensure equivalence, you know, from a trade point of view, and make sure the European industry isn't, you know, from a leakage side of things, um, and make sure that importers are paying the same rates as. Um, as domestic producers on certain materials. It also has an environmental outcome, a purposeful sort of instrument of change in exporting countries. If the taxes are linked to carbon intensity of source materials and production, there is a longer term incentive to try and get those countries to decarbonize and implement um, systemic change to, to decarbonize their, their processes as well. Those changes are going to take decades. If the carbon intensity is based on electricity produced on a grid, the decarbonization of that grid is going to take a long, long time. For that to happen, there needs to be long-term signaling of an instrument in the presence, an escalation of an instrument like CBAM over many, many decades. One of the successes of the UETS is its longevity and predictability. Back in 2007 or 8, we did a survey of all the major European power companies. And we said, how would your investment in low carbon power generation, <coughs> renewables or decarbonisation, be affected if the European emissions trading scheme was paused or didn't, didn't you know, that the prices weren't high? And a lot of them said, uh, it wouldn't affect us. We're on a decarbonization. So I'm talking about RWE, I'm talking about you know, the big, big companies. Their strategy was set in the context of a much more significant decarbonization journey that European was, Europe was clearly on. And so they were making huge strategic decisions around billion dollar capital investments because of the long term visibility of policy. Can an instrument like CBAM have that kind of longevity and predictability to allow countries, the exporting countries, to seriously engage in sort of decarbonizing their energy systems? Because it will take a long time. Oh, well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> Caroline? Maybe. I guess that, you know, I'll pick up a little bit on on my point. So, so you raise a good point that a lot, so a lot of the emissions that um, that are showing up in this uh, CBAM exposure index are actually indirect emissions from electricity, and the CBAM uh, is, you know, uh, imposed on firms. So, you know, firms have to document their their emission embedded emissions and then pay for that. So, so the question is, how much pressure then do these sort of limited number of industries, uh, the firms in them, can they put on the the host uh, uh, country government to help decarbonize the system, or do they have com uh, options themselves to contract uh, for? Uh, for clean energy as a means for um, for reducing their their CBAM liability. So, uh, so I think you know we have to remember this needs to be a multi-pronged uh, engagement um, to to try to have uh, if there's you know leverage intended for helping decarbonize the um, uh, the grid of of countries. Um, that, that are exposed to the to the CBAM, um, so you know 
I think, again, this helps sort of identify where, uh, where uh, interventions can be made in terms of, uh, you know, creative uh, climate finance and, and other ways of, of helping um, um, decarbonize energy systems in, in, these, in these countries. But, but again, this, you know, it has, uh, I think the CBAM does have some effect because it, it is, you know, part of this clear signal. So it's it's exporting the signal that you you know that has been created within Europe that Europe is on a decarbonization path, and their consumers are going to want uh, low carbon products. So it's it's telegraphing that you know this is the future that we're headed towards, and also I think the interest among other countries in uh, you know. Uh, in these kinds of policies and border measures. I think it's, it's telegraphing that, you know, the future needs to be a decarbonized one if you want to be exporting to a lot of these major, major players. Um, so that's where I think some of the, the outsized effect can potentially come from. Yes, please. Susan, yeah, I, I wonder, because <clears throat> I think the whole story is about whether this will, I mean, the EU cannot do this alone, right? I mean, the whole success of a CBAM would be that it turns to zero. And um, the investment security would be for me that the legislation is, is taking stepwise. And so we have maybe 10 years for investors to count on the CBAM as it stands today in the legislation by the EU. Um, but if the EU does not succeed in taking others along with this kind of system that should level the playing field, then there will be a problem for sure because high uh, EU carbon prices are in, in the horizon, right? Because we want to phase out everything. We want to become neutral. The last certificate will be sold in 2039, I recall. So these signals all go into the direction of a high carbon price unless there is decarbonization. And at CBAM is an add-on to, to level the playing field also abroad, but this needs to be you know, discussed with other key countries. And um, so it's really a bet on this future. And I, I think it's, it's not clear yet whether the CBAM will help the very long-term investment. It's in the making. Judy, you want to say? Sure, and my comment is um, a little bit tangential, and I won't comment on the, the CBAM specific um, context that you raised, but I think you're getting at a broader question around um, policy certainty and price certainty, and that's something that's certainly um, high on the radar um, on, for us in, in Canada and for the Canadian government. And we're, um, there's a lot of interest and attention on, on different ways in which we can kind of de-risk in longer term investments and provide some policy stickiness. Um, things like um, looking at um, contracts for difference is one type of instrument. So there's sort of early exploration um, in the Canadian context that we're doing um, uh, to sort of see if we can try and provide a bit more certainty. I, I talked about some of the ways that we're trying to embed it in the design by forecasting out. We learned early on that giving four years of a price trajectory was not enough for investors and businesses. That's not long enough. So um, I guess the question I would have... Um, more broadly, though, I, mean, I think, um, you know, there's policy uncertainty. Um, there's always policy uncertainty, not just on climate policy, but all kinds of policies. And I think one of the um, questions that um, I have, and this is just me personally, is, you know, trying to tease out um, kind of how much does the um, questions around um, policy certainty or change in the climate space, um, how do you disentangle that from kind of the other factors that are being, um, you know, fact, you know, weighed in as, as, as investors make big decisions around investments? And of course, as we look at rising carbon prices, it's significant. I'm not, not minimizing it, but um, I think sort of how do how do um, how does industry navigate the broader um, policy context and sort of weigh different um, changes over time is kind of a live question. But but certainly the exploration of, of how we can help de-risk it with um, sort of uh, public sector financial instruments is going to be interesting to explore. Kurt, you want to say something? Yeah. Very brief comment for a, a very uh, important and good question. But um, I mean, obviously, indeed, uh, providing stable long-term sig signals for investment is, is what we <coughs> always should have in mind if we think about uh, transformation. So this is, in that sense, a, a key issue that you raise. Um, when thinking about it, uh, I, I was actually reminded of uh, Susanna's uh, remark. 
that there's maybe a tendency to overburden the CBAM? I mean, is this the thing which by it itself is going to deliver um, um, strong incentives for a global carbon price that in addition is expected to be stable over the long run and, and therefore could, could provide strong investment signals outside of the EU? It seems a lot, um, to be honest, to, to expect from, from a single policy. Um, so in that sense, I mean, yes, it, it signals, provides signals in the right direction, but it does not by itself, I think, uh, lead to, to the result that you have in mind. More is needed for that. Um, and, and there, the, the point uh, about policy diversity comes in, I think. Uh, we, I mean, is a global carbon price the goal, as, as, as was suggested uh, some by our moderator? Well, I mean, net zero is the goal, right? So there may be different ways of, of, of getting there. Uh, and I think that this needs to be taken into account when we think about the different ways of, of providing investors, investor certainty that this happens in different ways uh, in, in different parts of the world. That said, I do agree with uh, Caroline's point about outsized effect. So, I mean, the figures she so showed on exposure, if you compare that to, to what I hear, not very systematic research, but just what I hear in terms of discussions on carbon pricing in places where it doesn't exist yet and all these kinds of things, um, much more than a year ago um, in different parts of the world, uh, also in parts of the world where the exposure to CBAM uh, didn't often even appear in, in your graph. Um, so that's this outsized effect, right? I mean, it, it allows creating a narrative um, which allows countries to make progress to, towards uh, carbon pricing, which is always of interest in a climate perspective, which today in a public finance perspective is also increasingly of interest um, given interest rates, given debt levels, um, sources of revenue um, are increasingly attractive. And that's part of the uh, um, dynamic as well, I think. Thank you, Kurt. I think there was a question over there. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip Foss from the German Ministry of Economics and Climate Action. Um, well, I have two technical questions, but I also wanted to come back on your question on why the Climate Club is called a club and not a coalition. Um, and uh, We were involved in, in these discussions which started in Germany, um, and to be honest, the idea was very different at the start. Um, I think the, the idea at the start was actually really to have a strong club um, which helps with carbon leakage and uh, carbon border adjustment measures, um, a club where everyone has a carbon price and then you could, you know, restrain from having carbon leakage measures uh, with, the, with the members or within the members of the club. Um, well, we all know that this idea really changed. <laughs> And now uh, it's it's more of a it's more of a coalition. It's more of a forum, actually. Um, but then the idea was out there. Um, people were talking about it. People were reacting on it. And I think that's the reason why the people stuck to the to the original name of it. Um, but yeah, now we have it. And I know a lot of people are not happy with it. Um, we also had like tough discussions on the name in the government. Um, but we also have a strong chancellor who really likes the idea of having a carbon club. And so um, I think that was the main reason why, why the name stayed like that. I didn't want to bother with that, but since we're talking about the narrative, and I think the narrative is the yeah. important part, you know, I raised the point. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And it's, a, it's always a good uh, yeah, idea to think about it again, maybe. Um, anyway, I have two questions. One was on the effective carbon race. Uh, uh, yeah, weights, right? Yes, um, that court presented. Um, I wonder whether they account for funding or like for free allocation, um, because a company may pay a carbon price of 100 euros and may get back 90 of these. Uh, so I was wondering if, if that's incorporated. Um, and then another question on Carolyn, which is even more technical, I guess. Um, <coughs> when you showed slide three, I think, you showed the exposure index. Um, and I wonder if that speci specifically focuses on uh, CBAM products or is it more broader focus? Thank you. <laughs> 
Go first. Thank you. Uh, so you're right, in, in the figures that I showed and the headline indicators that we use for effective carbon rates, they're marginal effective carbon rates. So not corrected for uh, free allocation in ETSs, also not corrected for uh, threshold in, in carbon taxes as exist in, in some countries, uh, for example, South Africa. Um, so they're the marginal signals, that's what we work with most. We do calculate, however, and so I said we will be doing an update uh, that will be released after summer, if all goes well. Um, we have, in the previous edition, provided some information on average rates, so that's what we call it. This is corrected for uh, free permit allocations. We will do that in much more detail in, in that upcoming edition, uh, because we think it's important. I mean, the, the, the issue about investment prospects was, was raised uh, for it, uh, investment decisions. This, this average rate uh, tends to be as important depending on the allocation rule, right? I mean, it really depends on what the allocation rule looks like. Uh, but that uh, metric is, is important from that point of view. So thank you for the suggestion. We'll be giving it more visibility next time. Yeah, no. Personally, I'm very excited to see that report. It's um, also something that I've been um, pushing colleagues at the bank to, to do for a broader set of uh, set of countries to understand, um, you know, how the role of free allocation. And, and I think the tricky part <coughs> is is also that you have uh, you know similar similar aspects in the indirect carbon pricing. So in the fuel excise taxes, there may be exemptions that you're paying above a certain amount. So, but you know, it's, it's, it's very, you know, the marginal carbon price signal is, is really what's sort of driving the incentives to reduce um, carbon intensity. Um, uh, the average carbon price signal is, is, you know, to what extent are these uh, costs being passed through uh, um, into uh, to products. So, so to what extent are you pricing embedded carbon, uh, which is really important when you're thinking about um, uh, CBAM type measures. Um, uh, so the other, as I'm excited that there's someone here asking about technical details. I, I um, and and it's a good question. So uh, there, you know, we should. Um, so the CBAM exposure index, it is uh, based on the CBAM product. So it's, it's also then, you know, it's a share of your trade uh, in, uh, as a global share in, trade in those products, not, uh, not all products. But uh, those, you know, we're relying on more aggregated measures. So it's not as specific, specific as the um, CBAM products. I, I think the biggest issue is, would probably be with fertilizers. So, uh, so we are relying on the Global Trade Assessment Project data, and so that's more aggregated to chem the chemicals sector. And so fertilizers are going to be a share of that. And so, so it depends then on, you know, uh, the relative sort of intensity of fertilizers versus the rest of your chemicals production. So yeah, so these are these are rough rough estimates. I think it's better for iron and steel, and, um, uh, but um, uh, but yes, they're not. It's it's not a, so in, in many in many ways the exposure is. Um, uh, you know, may well it may be higher, it may be lower. It, it depends on the the relative intensities. I think there is a question from Peter over there. Um, so I'm Peter Viss from EUI. Um, I have a question to the panelists, really, about CBAM's capacity to incentivize carbon pricing elsewhere in the globe. And do I characterize the situation correctly if I say that either the European institutions or, and the Commission, I suppose, who's going to be doing the heavy lifting and implementing this CBAM, either they set a high standard of criteria of carbon pricing, which carbon pricing schemes get a credit, and that might be, say, government-sponsored taxes or emissions trading, that I think would be a very restrictive, exclusive club, if I can use the word loosely. 
um, or they could have a more wider scope, effective carbon pricing, whether that be through other mechanisms like uh, high quality voluntary market credits or, dare I say it, implicit carbon pricing. And that would obviously be an engagement of much wider geographic uh, coverage. So, you know, is it going to be an exclusive club that gets a little bit of a credit? Or is it going to be a conversation with a much wider group of countries with a view to trying to get many more different countries engaged in a carbon pricing process? I'd be interested in other panelists. Um, if you're giving advice to the Commission, which way would you go? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> one for you. <laughs> Someone is listening here. <laughs> so who wants to go first? Maybe start from the other side. Sure. sure. Um, I mean, uh, my others will probably um, uh, speak to this in more detail, but I mean, I think it's a fair question. I think I, all I would say from, from, from my perspective where I sit is, I mean, we are strong advocates for explicit carbon pricing as, as an important mix in the toolkit. And certainly, um, thinks uh, you know. Or, or in our view, that's that's uh, the important, important um, that's the key consideration when we think about um, looking at um, equivalence and or how we um, fare under a CBAM. Um, I think I think the challenge too is on the flip side, and I think this is a topic that we haven't maybe dug into um, that maybe we we can a bit more, which is the challenge of. Of, of the actual operationalizing something broader. And others on, on this panel will speak to this in more detail, but certainly um, you know, the availability of data and methodological consistency in trying to um, assess that. I mean, I, I think about the practicalities are very challenging. And even if you then think, well, can, is there some kind of default value that starts to become very um, you know, less, um, less helpful and, and certainly um, less, um, less precise. So I think um, we're certainly advocating at the Canadian level for the importance of explicit pricing systems. Um, so, so I think um, our cards are on the table there. Thank you, Judy. Susan. Yeah, I would also um, go into that direction because I think there are several um, dimensions to this. First of all, there has been so much activity by the Commission to reach out to other countries to follow the ETS example, linking systems, um, or at least um, talking about carbon pricing as a way forward to cooperate on that there is a basis to, to bring this forward. It's not starting from scratch to demand from other countries who have the governance that, that's being said. I mean, we are talking about G20 maybe, if at all, who, who have really the, the capacity or to steer this kind of uh, fiscal or whatever you call, would call the, the tool in the context of, of um, national governance. So it's, it's also the question of overreaching um, uh, countries' governance that they have chosen for themselves. But still, I think the pressure needs to be kept up um, the voluntary carbon markets issue, we have discussed this yesterday. I think it's far too early because we have this front door, back door issue, which we discussed yesterday. So an early um, way uh, to signal, uh, signaling too early that there would be an option for offsets is, is a mistake to me because given that we, the EU is so successful in bringing attention to carbon pricing via the CBAM, this is a strategic issue, right? Um, it should keep, uh, keep up the spirit of a strict system that is really about explicit carbon pricing. And of course, over time, that could evolve into something else if there is, um, yeah, is there still being interest in cooperating on this tool. I, I've, I know that this is uh, harsh vis-a-vis -vis countries that do not have carbon pricing, but we've discussed so many times that there's a queue and the P in the equation of the CBAM, so the working on the embedded carbon um, that is being traded is the alternative. And this is uh, still there, so this is not ruled out if there's a strict approach. Sorry, Peter, I don't know. Well, thank you for your answer, actually. <clears throat> it was on my desk one of the questions concerning voluntary carbon markets, and I didn't dare asking, so <laughs> you also answered me. Uh, do you want to add something? Um, you know, I, 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 I'll just restate. I mean, what the the CBAM is doing is it's adjusted. It's adjusting for 
differences in the pricing of embodied carbon. And only carbon uh, direct or explicit carbon pricing policies price, uh, uh, price embodied carbon. Um, the, so a question I had on the proposal for, you know, for using you know, carbon offsets, um, uh, again, it gets a little awkward if you're, you know, if you're offering alternative compliance mechanisms that aren't available to, to EU firms. Um, so it wasn't clear to me if the proposal is to allow firms to reduce their calculation of embedded carbon by the number of offsets that they purchase, or, or you know, they demonstrate that oh, we've spent this money on on voluntary carbon. That would then, you know, the, if they're cheaper than the EU ETS price, then they would have to pay the the difference. Um, that might be a little more justifiable. But um, you know, I guess that, that there is is the question on so what what prices to what extent might you incorporate indirect carbon prices? I, again, it's the firms that are going to have to document whatever they've actually been paying on net and for their um, embedded carbon emissions. So um, uh, I usually, I, I try to avoid saying implicit for anything because that's often implicit carbon pricing is, has been used for a variety of things that could include non-pricing policies in there. I, I don't think that, that that's appropriate. Um, they, uh, you know, if they're effective, they will reduce the emissions intensity and be recognized that way. Um, and, and, you know, there are other fora for negotiating over a broader, broader range of, of policies for improving climate ambition. This not, we, we shouldn't be trying to hang everything on the poor little sea bam. Good. Uh, I think we have some interesting insights. I, I, I don't know whether I should say unanimity, but you know, in any case, there seems to be consensus over here. Uh, there was, yes, another question. Thank you very much. I have a rude question. <laughs> Please do. Um, <laughs> in, in most climate circles, uh, we would applaud the objectives of the CBAM. Outside our climate uh, family, it's characterized as a straight trade barrier. How confident are panelists that the CBAM, the European CBAM is WTO compliant, um, or you know, does the European Union care, or indeed how much um, litigation do you expect? Thank you. Told you it was a rude question. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. We have to be ready for litigation. So who wants to go first? Kurt? Well, we, we did, um, in 2020, we did a pretty detailed review of, of we at the OECD did a pretty de detailed review of you know what CBAM could look like, what properties it could have, how these various aspects sit with <coughs> WTO stipulations, which to be clear is not at all my specialty. But what came out of that report is um, the, the, the view that it is possible to design a, um, a WTO compliant uh, mechanism. I mean, it is possible, that's a very strong statement. You can't say that ex ante, but this is, this is likely that, that there is a path there. So that's, that's what, what we found there. Uh, um, so in, in that sense, um, I mean, that answer is relatively clear. Uh, will there be litigation? Well, countries have said that they would, so yes. Honest answer. <laughs> Does anybody want to add this? Yeah, I, I would follow Court's uh, answer, in, and, and I would like to add that the EU was really, um, it was astounding how the Commission managed to go strictly along the cook, the recipe of how to <laughs> design a carbon adjustment at the border according to WO rules, but still there are some open um, open ends and that is something you could put it to the test with. And also, I think one thing is still not decided yet, that's the question of export rebates, where you would go openly against the understanding, the legal understanding under the WTO, what constitutes an actionable subsidy. And um, But still, I also think there will be there will be claims being made because this is sometimes just either it's driven by you want to clarify legal issues or you want to put a political message to it and so these announcements are already out there. 
So I, I guess this is uh, hard to circumvent in a way if the EU moves forward. Another interesting <laughs> food for thought, <laughs> I guess. Um, I would go for two short questions to conclude, then I want to give the floor to Massimo for the final remarks. And I have Fabio and Geneve. Thanks. Uh, Fabio Santeramo, Robert Schumann Center of the UI. Uh, very good presentation, great presentation. I just have a curiosity. I was actually quite intrigued by the slide on uh, the impact by sector. And I found, well, we know, of course, that, uh, or we could expect that transport has been very much interested by that. My question is, to what extent Sibama uh, or all those measures actually are going to impact on the global value chain and to what extent these side effects have been in some sense compute or c taken into account by the countries that are, uh, you know, uh, are seen to be even the least, the developed one. Thanks. Who wants to answer the question? Uh, yeah, maybe I can collect also the second question and then we do a final round. Thank you. Maybe a, more of a technical question. Have you, in designing the CBAM, have you looked at the potential for what I would call contract shuffling? Uh, so either within a producing country a facility switching contract for electricity just to show that they have a lower carbon footprint, mm -hmm. therefore not to pay the CBAM exporting to the EU, or seeing the goods instead of coming from country A, coming from country B, and you just have a displacement of the goods throughout the world so that the lower footprint one goes to the EU and the rest of it goes elsewhere. Uh, have you looked at it, and what can be done to try and resolve that? Yeah, indeed, yeah. a good question. Yeah, so, I'll start with that one. Yeah, the technical I question. I think that's a great and an important question, and uh, I didn't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer, but that's, uh, that's an another important limitation of, uh, you know, of what you can do with the CBAM. So again, it's, it's applied to firms. Um, the, so, uh, the question, in terms of the contract reshuffling, um, that can maybe be addressed a bit in, in terms of, um, you know, what you allow in terms of calculating indirect emissions. Um, so, you know, is it, ha is it just the country or, well, the grid average for your, for your you know, uh, local jurisdiction or can, uh, so what, uh, would a firm ha need to document that they're um, act contracting with renewable energy or, or, or something? So, um, so I think that definitely needs thought. The, the, but there's you know broader reshuffling that I, it's basically impossible to deal with. So you know you 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 are kind of incentivizing the relatively clean firms to be the ones exporting to the EU, and then the dirty ones can sell to the rest of the world. Right, and, um, and so, so when we look at this, you know, our exposure index, um, you know, that's, it's also the question of, you know, how, uh, you know, an important part is like, how trade dependent are you on the EU? How easy is it, for, you know, the flip side is how easy is it for you to uh, find other markets for your goods away from the EU? And that, that is going to diminish the incentive effect of the CBAM to the extent you can. So that's, you know, why it's really important to, um, you know, sort of that, you know, this is sort of baseline measures from, from the status quo and, and identifying really where do we need to go in with, with more carrots <laughs> and, and assistance to help uh, these industries decarbonize rather than just trying to find other, other markets that accept um, carbon intensive goods. Yeah, I, I have two brief comments on this question. Um, I think um, 
the Commission has included a kind of review of trade data, and if there's obvious reshuffling, they want to intervene. I, I don't know how this is going to happen, the secondary legislation, but tight monitoring of, of trade data <coughs> is definitely needed. Um, then I would like to make two points. I think if a CBAM would work in the um, way it is thought of, it would put uh, suppliers to the EU in a new competitive setting because it's charging the embedded carbon. So it comes to a situation where some steel will be more uh, competitive than others that, it that wasn't before because you now charge on based on the carbon that is being emitted. And this is, has to be dealt with by the suppliers, but the key point I wanted to make is the, it's the importer in the EU who decides what's being imported. After all, we will learn a lot in the first phase what are the flows we are having without any charges attached to them. And it will be the importers who are monitored who will do the reshuffling after all. I mean, in the first uh, instance, since they will make up their mind where to, to get the supply from. And um, this uh, comes back to the supply chain question. We will also see some kind of changes here in the, in the supply to the EU which is interesting, which will be interesting to say the least. Um, so it, it is an action that could be taken by the exporter, but it has not to be taken by the exporter. It's rather the question where uh, the EU would, the companies in the EU would like to get their stuff from. So somehow it's in the EU hands. Oh. <laughs> At least we can have an idea, we will get an idea about this mm -hmm. effect soon. Yeah. Um, what do I add? No. Okay, then I would say I would give the floor now to Massimo to uh, run the show uh, for the conclusions because uh, it's not an easy job, I guess, but... <laughs> well, it was difficult things, but first of all, thanks, uh, the, uh, Simone. Shall I sit there? No. Uh, yes, probably for, uh, for, to for the, the benefit camera. of for the, the audience of, online. Of those online. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, Simone, for organizing this incredible panel and uh, um, proposing a very difficult topic in front of a panel. And yet there's been quite a high level of consensus, as you were saying. I mean, you ask the topic and the title of this panel was large enough to, to be intimidating, <laughs> including, you know, not just the SIBA, but, you know, cooperation, <coughs> carbon collapse and leakage. And, uh, and a lot has been said, uh, which I can certainly not summarize in a couple of minutes, but let me go back to, you, to the questions that you posed in front of the panel, which essentially were three. Question one, is the CBAM fit for purpose? Uh, question two, what is about implementation, uh, secondary legislations and all the details? And question three, what are the impl broader implications for developing countries and for international cooperations, thinking about uh, the Conference of the Party, UNFCCC, and international climate policies. So, on the fit for purpose, there seems to be a relatively high consensus that it depends what the purpose is. There's been an extraordinary piece of a legislation and achievement by the European Commission, but of course, insofar, <coughs> we restrain its capacity in what it has to do, which is levelize the playing field and price embedded emissions. Um, there also seem to be quite a consensus that in itself, uh, especially if Europe will pursue it alone, and depending on the carbon pricing, uh, and depending on also on the details of implementation, but in itself, is not, it's not going to be enough for, for real uh, you know, club enforcement or for promoting climate cooperation at a high scale. However, there seems to be a quite a consensus. It can be facilitate uh, the creation or the promotion of, of important principles, including polluter pays principles, and also ideally the promotion uh, of carbon pricing elsewhere outside, outside Europe, which is of course in itself would be an incredible achievement. Now, industry is one of the many sectors we need to decarbonize. By the way, it's not, only, it's not the one that we need to decarbonize first. Because neutrality doesn't mean that, first of all, neutrality doesn't mean that each sector has to be net zero necessarily. As a system has to be net zero, which leaves open up a you know, possibility of also using offsets and removals, as we discussed also yesterday, to compensate for some of the very hard to abate sectors, which are often the ones which are subject to CBAM regulations. And as we have seen, sectors such as transportation, for example, are the sectors where some of the taxi, the high taxes are, and maybe in the residential sector also. Um, however, some of these sectors are being decarbonized also through non-price measures. 
thinking about other European legislations on transportation, uh, such as, of course, the internal combustion engine, uh, the, trust, the, the electrification of transportation being something which is proceeding at an incredibly fast pace, uh, which will also raise issues, uh, tax <coughs> issues about the tax revenues coming from those sectors, and the electrification of end use also in the residential sector, such as through heat pumps, also happening extremely fast. Uh, probably in the next 10 years and at an incredibly fast pace, especially in Europe, obviously. Uh, which means then eventually, yes, industry is becoming the key, and that's why it is so high politically. It is also high politically because, uh, of course, uh, being very concentrated uh, and, and very powerful and very influential industry, you need to win this, the support of the industry to, to get legislation through. So in this sense, the scope, uh, the fit for purpose, uh, is, is, is right in what has been uh, legislated so far, although it will depend on details. Uh, um, but of course, within the, the context uh, of, uh, of a sector which is, is going to become more and more important, but which at the moment is not the major sector in terms of, of emissions. Implementation, uh, discussed some of the details even, even just now uh, on coverage of emissions, uh, on uh, pricing policies versus non-pricing policies. There seems to be agreement here, non-pricing policy being you know, accounted already for in the carbon intensity of products. Uh, not, 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 don't try to calculate the implicit carbon price because that would be difficult to do and not the right thing to do anyhow. Um, uh, and and uh, you know, other, other discussions about all policy provisions. Ultimately, the flexibility of some of the frameworks, such as the one that we're describing in Canada, might be here quite key. Uh, to ensure that, that the costs are minimized uh, in those sectors and specifically in nations and even sub-nationals because we often talk about nations but sometimes there's, these sectors are highly concentrated in specific parts of specific countries and it's often a sub-national issue, a regional issue, even more than a national one. All those things will need to be decided and of course uh, um, uh, discussed more in detail when secondary legislation comes but at least a high level of agreement about um, some of these issues are, are clear, including WTO compatibility, according to which the panel seems to agree that there is good evidence that the, the, the European Commission has done a, relative, a very good job, actually, in, in designing a WTO compatible policy. And then the last question is really implication for developing countries, more broadly, for international climate cooperation. This is key because what Europe does depends on the success of international climate policies for two reasons. First, because we want climate will, will actually going to have effective climate uh, results only if that happens globally, or at least to a large degree. And secondly, because, of course, European policies depend on the success also of other countries reducing emissions as well. Otherwise, there will be, of course, um, and there will be a backlash or possibly a backlash against uh, such a stringent climate policies when you see that uh, this is the only legislation, only countries which is moving in that direction. It is not the case. We heard yesterday positive news also from the U.S. and other constituencies, but uh, I think this has to remain at the, at the top of our minds. Uh, and here, obviously, the, the issues in terms of distributional repercussions for some of the developing countries came up. It could be large, but maybe not as large as sometimes, sometimes stated, depending on relative or absolute uh, metrics uh, uh, being measured. Uh, um, still, it is an issue about fairness, uh, which needs to be accounted for, especially for countries which are relatively poor. And in this discussion, by the way, because obviously that would have been, been too much, but we purposely discussed about mitigation and not about adaptation and climate impacts, which is good for, the, for, for what we are discussing here. But of course, if you see it from the other side, uh, that's an argument also for saying, uh, uh, given responsibility and climate risks combined, uh, uh, for, being, for being potentially critical about uh, the, the distributional repercussions and the equity repercussions uh, of, uh, of, uh, of such an instrument, uh, which of, of course will depend uh, on, on the scope, on the level of carbon taxations in the ETS system, uh, and to what extent, the, what kind of emissions will be uh, included and priced. Uh, there's clear agreement that uh, the carbonization needs to start and carbon pricing is a good instrument that should be promoted and CBAN can uh, you know, facilitate, facilitate this. And it should start in those places where we know uh, that are fundamentally crucial for uh, enabling decarbonization in all the sectors. Essentially, decarbonizing electricity as fast as possible and promoting electrification as fast as possible. 
plus energy efficiency also as a third measure. These are the three key things that needs to be done in those places, maybe not in Europe, which is advancing fast on this, but in those other countries where we also want to see emission reductions. And those will not necessarily be done by CBAM because they, do, they, do apply, they apply to different sectors. But this CBAM could be part of a larger discussion, um, such as the one done by Canada on policies to accelerate carbon pricing worldwide, or the initiative by the OECD that Kurt was mentioning before. And I think that's, that's really where the value. Ultimately, the CBAM success will depend really on the clear price signals, on providing policy certainty, which came up uh, also as a key uh, policy enabler, and, of course, to what extent CBAM is linked to other policy tools, which are price-based, but remember there's huge non-price instruments which are also everywhere now and seem to be actually even growing. Um, uh, and, and I think this needs to be looked into this perspective. And also how to, to, to be fair and to promote uh, uh, cooperation. I think, uh, and also, on the other hand, can provide crucial source of revenues at a time where the investments are needed. Uh, many countries have high debt, uh, interest rates are high, and this is becoming an issue in terms of finding the investments needs, which we know should be scaled up uh, very significantly to, to mitigate climate change, not to talk about to adapt to the risk of climate change. In a way, you know, the carrot and sticks came up a lot, and it was something to be expected uh, when you talk about CBAM. Um, the carrot six comes from a cartoon in the 30s uh, of two donkeys racing, uh, one had the carrot and one had the stick. And uh, well, in that cartoon, the, the, the carrot was winning actually, and uh, over the stick. Um, but I think what has really come out here is that this is a stick and a carrot at the same time. And actually the best use is to turn the stick into a carrot, uh, you know, make it look like. Uh, <laughs> That's, I think that's the purpose, actually, of, uh, of, of the carrot, uh, not being particularly uh, you know, tasty, maybe, but uh, resembling. Um, and of course, these were two donkeys. And Churchill used this in, at the end of the 30s uh, um, in relation to, to, to escalating wars at the time. Uh, and, uh, and the geopolitics that is, you know, really changed everything, and as Joss yesterday said uh, in his opening remarks, is something we should consider when we look at this and look at its entirety and, and you know, in its complexity. But thanks, uh, and it was for me mostly a learning experience. I'm not even an, an expert on the topic, so I learned really a lot. And, and Thank you, Max, for a non-expert. It's, <laughs> it's a real good job. And so I think we can come to a close and um, I'd like to thank all of you for your great and insightful interventions. I must admit I was also a bit intimidated by the topic, although uh, it was my choice, you know, make silly mistakes all the time. Um, and I was also a bit intimidated by the room because this was a court of justice in, in well, the past. And, I, I, and, it looks like a bit. It looks really. like a bit. <laughs> and, you know, uh, you, you, you don't know whether you will come with a good verdict in the end, especially because ah, yes, over there right. it's written the law is equal for everybody. Uh, you know, uh, we should change it into a tone is a tone or something similar that <laughs> <laughs> we feel more comfortable with. So having said that, thanks a lot, all of you, for the participation, for your questions, and we now can stop here and move back to the Medici's frescoes, uh, less intimidating probably. <laughs> Thank you.